Welcome to CGD's conversations with the candidates for the presidency of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is the final conversation in the series with Odile Renaud Basso, Director General at the French Treasury and nominee for the EBRD presidency. Madame Renaud Basso, welcome and thank you for agreeing to take part in this conversation. Thank you very much for your, inv your invitation and to give me the opportunity to express my views and present myself. Thank you. Great. So let me start by asking you what you think the strengths and the weaknesses are of the EBRD as we stand today in the midst of a pandemic and an unprecedented global health and economic crisis. Well, I think one of the key strengths of the EBRD is that it has a very unique mandate, which is uh, focusing very much on the private sector and the concept of transition and with a link with the political environment and the, uh, um, the concept of democracy. So I think that the EBRD has uh, developed its experience since uh, the time it was created in the 90s, building on its mandate and uh, on its very unique strengths, which are, in my view, in the number of, I would mention, five or six. The first one is the fact that it has a huge um, set, a wide set of instruments. It can in intervene in debt, guarantees, equity, direct and indirect. It has, uh, it is very well uh, established in the countries of operation with the large networks and people in the ground to help identify projects, working in cooperation with the authorities, with the private sector, with the uh, economic environment, and this is a huge asset. The, um, based on these two, um, two assets, the EBRD has been able to develop, and this is quite unique in the universe of um, multilateral de development banks, it has the capacity to finance small and big projects. So we're moving from um, uh, investment uh, below 10 million uh, euros, 10 million dollars, uh, up to uh, large scale investment with an average of investment of 25 million euros and uh, tailor-made projects with high value added. And this is something which is quite unique, I think, in the environment of uh, the NDBs and with very high uh, risk appetite. The fourth um, asset is its, its involvement in the policy making. Uh, EBRD is not only a bank uh, providing financing resources, but it's also um, intervening in the context of country strategy, providing policy advice, um, so as to ensure that the financing is um, providing the best positive outcome it can do in a global environment and uh, in the, with, it's accompanied with structural reforms which are very important for the success and the development of the private sector. And in this policy advice, the EBRD is working with the governments, but also the private sector, the key stakeholders and so forth. So this is a very important feature also. And the Five, uh, important, five key assets is uh, the quality of the staff uh, with a diversity of experience of origin coming from the private sector, bank specialists, sectoral specialists, development specialists, and I think this brings a uh, very strong value to the bank. I think the governance structure and the shareholder structure of the bank is also a very important uh, asset for the bank. It has a large, it's a multilateral bank with uh, all countries of operation being also members, uh, shareholders of the bank. It has a strong European back backbone, close relationship with the European institution, but also uh, having a global dimension. And I think this is uh, something which is very valuable for the bank because countries of operation are very much involved in the governance, are interested as a, a shareholder of the bank also. So there is a sort of alignment of interests. And last uh, but not least, uh, the bank has a very strong financial position, uh, lots of reserve, AAA rating, and this 
gives it gives it a um, strong um, uh, balance sheet and ability to uh, support uh, in the context of the crisis we are uh, going through to, to provide adequate support for the countries of operation. And to conclude on the, on the assets of the bank, I think that its experience uh, in providing support and accompanying countries in their transition, moving from uh, post-communist era to, uh, for a number of countries, membership of the European Union, European Union, for example, is a very good example of, an, uh, of what the bank can um, provide and um, uh, it illustrates its um, capacity to um, accompany, accompany successfully countries in very important transition uh, events. And um, that's a very strong, gives it a very strong credibility. In what, I mean, I think that I will stop here <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the strengths of the bank, which is quite a lot already. Thank you. And for the weaknesses? For the weaknesses, I think that, um, or the, I would call them areas for improvement, I think uh, that the bank can uh, deepen its cooperation with um, the other multilateral institutions, um, all the global, I mean, we know that uh, um, all MDBs work uh, in a cooperative manner, but I think more can be done in order to ensure that uh, each of the bank is uh, used with relying on its key features, it, where it has the most value added, and uh, where it can provide the most, for, most value for money in terms of development. So I think that this is an area where more can be done. I mean, a lot of progress have already been done, but I think we can go further in terms of cooperation, um, using uh, MDBs in a, in a more um, integrated manner and, and so forth. And the second area, I think that the bank here also has quite a, done, has done a lot compared with others, in particular in terms of um, uh, evaluation, assessment of the impact of its operation. But I think that here also we can go beyond and, uh, um, and develop uh, knowledge management and so forth. The last uh, point I would say is that uh, uh, one of the key, um, key challenges for the bank is to manage to have a I mean, common view among shareholders about what are the key strategic uh, priorities and how it should go uh, about in the uh, future development. So then, what, what is your vision for the future of the EBRD? And how would you use this period to start thinking about the shape of things to come? I, mean, I think the, the future of the EBRD should be focused on continuing to provide support for the country of operation, pursue its mission of stabilization of the enlarged neighborhood, and fostering transition towards the best standards at the economical, political, social, and environmental level, while responding to new strategic challenges. And I think the key challenge in the future would be to continue in both paths. I mean, the core sector of the activity and existing um, countries of operation and pursuing deepening what has been engaged, while addressing the new challenges, which are quite numerous in terms of gender, migration, skill force, demographic issues, and of course, uh, last but not least, uh, climate issue and energy transition. Um, so I think this is what the bank needs to address in the coming years. And um, it has to do that in a country, all its countries of operation, which are 38, with different state of transition and different challenges. So the the key responsibility of the bank is to find the right tools for the countries depending on where it is in the transition, um, in the transition path. And this has to be done in a context which is, which is particularly challenging for the whole economy and the whole international institution, which is the COVID crisis, which has provided, which has caused a great shock, a major economic shock 
at the global level and in all the countries um, uh, across the world. And this has created additional challenges, but I think the EBRD is very well placed to help going through this difficult period while continuing to provide the support to foster the transition, which is at the core of the EBRD mandate. In a way, the EBRD is at a turning point because it has to think that some countries which are very close to have done the transition and on which the, the, the issue of graduation is being discussed and has to be dealt with uh, in a um, pragmatic and efficient way, while on the other hand, there, are, there is some debate about a possible enlargement going beyond what has been decided um, in the uh, last few years about the Medi southern and um, Mediterranean region. And um, all these challenges, as, I mean, all these issues have to be um, dealt with in an integrated manner and ensuring that the resources that shareholders give to the VRD. Uh, to fulfill its mandate are, are um, used in the best and the more efficient manner so as to, to deliver, to, have, to be very effective for to fulfill the development uh, mandate of the bank. Thank you. Uh, we'll come to the thematic and geographic uh, priorities in a bit. But let me ask you, if you are chosen to serve as president of the EBRD, what would be the top two or three things against which you would like your term to be judged? I think that um, the first one would be um, the ability of the bank to continue to uh, provide and to, um, to increase um, its delivery in terms of support uh, to the private sector. I think this is one of the very specific features of the bank, and uh, this is an area where uh, the bank needs to continue and to be to be to continue to be at the top uh, in its in all the countries it's intervening. The second priority for me, on which I would like to be uh, judged, and I think that's very important uh, priority for the bank, is um, to accompany the country in the countries in economic and uh, green transition, in, uh, um, sorry, environmental and energy transition. I think the countries in which the VRD operate um, are facing challenging in this respect. Uh, and it's very important for the bank and it's one of the, its core responsibility to accompany them in order to ensure that they can grow economically and develop uh, themselves while ensuring that they are participating and contributing to um, the fulfillment of uh, the climate the climate objective and the Paris Agreement objective. And the third, um, third priority and on which I would like to be judged is, is the human resources and the quality of uh, the bank staff and the quality of the diversity of the recruitment and uh, and the ability of the bank to attract uh, high potential uh, human capital resources. Thank you. So moving on more specifically to the current crisis, um, how will the bank's activities have to differ from business as usual due to the crisis? And do you foresee any short-term and long-term changes to the bank's operations and activities stemming from the crisis? I think that the, in the very short term, and, and uh, it has already um, started a few months ago, the key priority for the bank uh, in the first stage of the crisis is uh, to provide uh, some rapid support to its clients and the countries of operation. And, uh, Everywhere in the world, all countries and all multilateral development institutions have uh, focused on this uh, very rapid liquidity support for uh, enterprise um, uh, companies so as to avoid that uh, the lockdown which has taken place or which, which is still taking place in a number of countries does not have does not uh, trigger a collapse of the economy and uh, uh, massive bankruptcies and so forth. So I think this 
has been the first priority and um, it should remain, because we are in a period of very high uncertainty, it should remain a priority in the coming months. Um, there has been, uh, there is a recovery support facility which is uh, uh, providing this short-term short -term liquidity to existing clients and this is very important as a first reaction, immediate reaction and so forth. And it's, we should continue to work um, on this. The second stage is to provide support to kickstart the economy. So I think that uh, moving from a liquidity phase to a solvency phase, I think that, uh, um, and I can see in that in, in France uh, from the, what I'm doing here with uh, public, in, public support to companies, uh, in the second phase, we will have to ensure that companies have sufficient own resources, equity to, uh, find, to finance their development. Uh, and the, the priority will not be only to avoid bankruptcy, but also to support investment and the capacity to rebound and to uh, develop new markets, new activities, and so forth. So that, will, that should be the second focus of the um, EBRD. Um, and in the longer term, I think that the bank will have to, uh, I mean, that's longer term objective, but that should already be uh, reflected in the current activity to continue to support the longer term challenges, uh, which I mentioned, like uh, climate change, um, uh, inclusiveness, um, and so forth. I think that, um, in a way, the shock uh, we are facing and the huge uh, which has a huge impact on the economies with a huge uh, shift in GDP, I mean, huge reduction of GDP and so forth. That is also an opportunity to um, develop new business models, new activities uh, to address these long-term challenges. There are also some uh, um, uh, longer-term impact of the crisis, uh, which will probably be related to uh, shift in uh, global value chain, reorganization of global value chains, reorganization of, uh, um, I mean, production function across the world, because the crisis has revealed in a way some, uh, that there, are, there may be some weaknesses related to over dependency of a single point of production and so forth. So there will be I'm sure some willingness to reorganize some uh, value chains. And this could be an opportunity for a number of countries uh, on which the EBRT operates uh, with the possibility to attract investment and reallocation of um, investment. So I think that um, will be, I mean, the way we can see today the challenges uh, that the EBRT will have to, uh, to address in the coming. Um, now already and in the coming months. Uh, of course, much will depend on how the pandemic will evolve and, um, and how the, what will be the economic impact. But uh, what is clear is that um, the EBRD should be there and remain there to provide some counter-cyclical support to um, the, country, the countries in which it operates and to be able to accompany its clients in all the countries. That's great, thank you. Uh, you mentioned climate. Um, so how would you make sure that the climate agenda remains front and center of the EBRD's investments uh, in the COVID era? I mean, I think the climate objective are already very well encored in, uh, in the EBRD activity and uh, has been at the I've been at the core of the BRD activity since uh, a long, I mean, quite a long time. EBRD has already done a lot uh, for the green agenda, inclu including by developing the uh, green economic transition approach, which has been uh, progressively um, uh, updated and strengthened. And this model has been very successful. And the EBRD is, not, is now very much at the forefront of the MDBs uh, in this area with a 50% uh, green 
economic transition ratio objective and an ambition to, to work towards uh, Paris alignment through systematic project screening and um, and uh, what one of the challenges will be to implement this ambitious objective in the coming years. So I think that the policy uh, is there, the objective and the ambition and the support from shareholders on this, uh, these objectives are there, but what will be crucial is to find the project to imp and to implement them in the concrete terms in the coming uh, years. I think that um, uh, there is more to be done to, mean, to, mainstream, to mainstream climate consideration, both in the banks' investment and in internal activities. I think that uh, developing also in the bank activity um, climate objective and to assess, I mean, the, the way activities are organized in regard with uh, objectives objective we all share is, will be very important. Of course, uh, in the context of the uh, COVID crisis, there may be some temptation to reconsider some of the objective and so forth, but I think that in view of the involvement of the bank in this area since uh, the last few years, and in view of the importance of the challenges we are collectively facing, uh, it will be very important to keep uh, the direction and uh, this objective at the core of, um, uh, of the activities of the bank uh, mandate and uh, concrete activity. And I think that enhancing cooperation across uh, multilateral, multilateral development bank on these issues will also be very important in order to have dynamic across um, Multilateral, multilateral development banks uh, that will help uh, all of them to achieve their objectives. You also mentioned gender. Um, as you know, the EBRD has a gender strategy. But do you think it's being implemented well enough? Or, or do you think the EBRD should be doing more to pay attention to gender, both in its external investments, but also in its uh, own internal policies and administration? I, mean, I think the EBRD is, uh, as you said, that there has already a gender strategy and has been focusing on this, uh, this objective uh, in its activity, but also in its uh, recruitment and so forth. So I think this is an issue which is uh, an issue where progress are, I mean, have, needs some constant. Uh, uh, prioritization and uh, constant support and in order to ensure that uh, the objective which can be set and, and the, the focus on this issue remains sustained and I think that uh, uh, I know very well as a management of a big financial institution today in the public administration that this is a challenge which is um, permanent to find to be able to recruit, to promote, uh, and to, uh, uh, to ensure uh, equal opportunities, equal careers um, for, all, uh, for all. And I think so this will need some constant support. Um, I think that one, uh, in the activity of the bank, uh, one possible uh, way to continue to promote and to enhance the effectiveness of uh, uh, in the implementation of this objective or reaching this objective could be to um, ensure as it's done with uh, a climate to, to look at all projects with a gland, with the, looking at its impact on the gender uh, balance. Sometimes it, I know that it, it can appear like a sort of additional criteria which, uh, which can be cumbersome and so forth, but I think in the end, and we do that in France with gender budgeting, in the end I think it's very effective in order to, to show that we always look at the impact of what we are doing um, with a view to reach this objective. Some projects may be very far away from the objective, some may, may be much more closer and delivering much more on the objective, but looking at all project with, the, with this criteria in mind could be very effective in the future. So do you think the EBRD should set measurable targets? 
I think that's, um, uh, that should be considered. That should be a decision, I mean, of course, that will be a decision uh, by the board and the shareholders, but I think that should be considered. Um, it's always uh, a trade-off between uh, the ambitions, the feasibility, and, and how to, to, to read the past, but I think that, that should be discussed and considered. Great, thank you. Um, maybe moving on now to the EBRD's countries of operation. Uh, what is your view of uh, former President Chakrabarti's proposed uh, expansion uh, into sub-Saharan Africa? And, and what do you think is needed to enable the EBRD to be really effective in that region? First of all, I think that um, the sub-Saharan region is, uh, and the, sub the sub-Saharan Africa development is a very important um, issue for Europe. It's an issue of stability of the neighborhood of Europe. So I think in that respect, it makes a lot of sense for um, the EBRD to look at what it can provide and how it can contribute to the development of uh, the sub-Saharan continent. Um, this, but this being said, uh, I think that the EBRD has to stick also to the core features and the DNA of its mandate, which is the focus on the private sector and with all the the elements of the mandate I mentioned before, which is uh, private sector, democracy, and, and so forth. And I think that um, in this respect, it would be important to look at also what, would be, what could be the value added of the EBRD. In my view, the EBRD can, because of its expertise in uh, the private sector development and developing the envir an environment which would be favorable for to enhance uh, private sector initiative, private sector financing, and so forth, the EBRD can bring, some, can bring something in sub-Saharan countries uh, which, on which the, the degree of development and so forth will be strong enough uh, in order for the EBRD to find projects and to be able to be effective and in, its, uh, in its support and its investment in line with uh, the key principle of its mandate. So I think that there is some room for uh, looking into the extension of the mandate uh, of EBRD in sub-Saharan countries both because it's a challenge for Europe and for the world economy, and also because I think the EBRD can bring something um, in these countries. Also because it can, as I was saying, it can, uh, it's a bank which can develop very small projects, uh, which, I mean, uh, has an ability to uh, intervene in very different kind of projects also, that, and that can be very effective in sub-Saharan sub countries. So my approach would be to um, focus on some countries on which it would make sense not to have a global enlargement of the mandate, to look in some countries on which uh, the, the private sector is already sufficiently developed, where there are a num sufficient number of projects for um, the BRD to be able to provide some value added. One key condition for um, success in this area is first of all the support and that a sufficient consensus among shareholders and this is that it's such an approach and such a move would be broadly supported by uh, the uh, shareholders and this is still being very widely discussed i think the second condition is um, to start, I mean, on sort of a targeted approach, uh, so as to ensure to test and try in a way. And the third condition would be to do that in close cooperation with other MDBs, so as to avoid crowding out other MDBs, uh, competition among, among MDBs and so forth. So I think that we need to find a way, if the decision is taken to move in that direction, to find a way to cooperate effectively with um, our partners. So you mentioned uh, cooperation and collaboration with partners. Now thinking a little bit about the wider European development finance architecture 
and specifically the proposals that came out of the wise persons group on the future of the European development finance architecture. And in particular, the debate around the roles of the EBRD and the European Investment Bank. So what are your views on the future institutional composition of European development finance? And, and how do you see the role of the EBRD evolving in relation to the EIB? I think the, uh, the report that you mentioned um, has been very useful in uh, giving some clarity and some input to the discussion on um, the key challenges that Europe is facing because Europe is uh, the most important uh, contributor worldwide in terms of uh, development support, development finance, and does not have always the, first of all, the visibility, but also the strategic um, orientation um, to, to push some policies and to uh, uh, develop a consistent approach uh, between what member states are doing, what different institution, European institutions uh, are doing. So I think the, the report was very helpful in, uh, I, I mean, identifying the challenges and the features, the, the strengths and weaknesses of the different uh, institutions and of the governance of uh, the overall framework. And there are some short, there were some in the report, some very short term recommendations, which I think can be implemented very quick, very easily in terms of uh, strategic guidance, co coherence of the approach and so forth. Um, this being said, uh, there, there will be now a discussion on uh, the follow-up of the report. The report proposed some quite radical options which uh, may be quite, uh, quite far-reaching in terms of changes in governance and so forth. This will be, of course, a discussion first for European countries, then for shareholders of the EBRD and the EIB. Um, in my view, what what is clear is that um, the two banks have very different features. Uh, EIB is purely European. Uh, EBRD is uh, international, multilateral, with a strong European uh, participation and strong European backbone, uh, as I was saying. And the two institutions have very different mandate and ways of intervention uh, in the countries they intervene in. The EIB is main, focusing mainly on um, massively in terms of amount and so forth on your financing for European projects and has a inter large international intervention, but in, in the overall mandate of the EIB is uh, relatively um, uh, not marginal, but it's one tenth or something of, of the EIB intervention. So I think it's much smaller than its um, European focus and is a bank which is um, very well um, uh, framed to develop large, big uh, tickets for financing and um, because it's, it's, of its very large balance sheet and a very large, large amount of financing it provides, provides uh, every year. The EBRD has a very different focus, focus, so focus mainly on the private sector and Policy uh, attached with policy recommendation, policy strategies, uh, which is not done by the EIB. So I think each, as I, to sum up, each institution has very different features, and um, in a way they can cooperate and complement each other uh, in the countries they intervene. There, has, there is an MOU and there has been a lot of experience of cooperation. I think this can be deepened. Uh, and uh, develop further, further, so as to avoid, so as to ensure that there is uh, complementarity and that uh, the, the two institutions can build uh, on each other in order to uh, be more effective in the delivery of its mandate. What I think is also very important in the European architecture is that it remains uh, open. Uh, you know that the EBRD is uh, um, one of the um, uh, operator in a way for, uh, for EU funds. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, used by the, the European institution um, as a way to 
implement some of the policies, and I think this is uh, this has proved very effective, and this should uh, remain in the future in the future program of uh, international uh, activity of the European Union. Great, thank you very much. And finally, can you tell us something about your own career and background, and how your experiences have shaped you to be an effective president of the EBRD? So I've worked a lot in the uh, finance and uh, development area all my careers. Uh, I spent a lot in the a lot of time in the finance ministry in France, dealing with. I started my career in the first of all in Cour des Comptes, which uh, gave me some. Uh, financial rigor in a way, because I was controlling, you know, a sort of auditor, public auditor. And then I moved very quickly in the finance ministry um, in France, dealing with development issues. I started in uh, dealing with the um, African countries. Uh, so, and uh, a monetary agreement between France and uh, West African countries. And then I was working for the Paris Club as secretary general of the Paris Club. So dealing with the debt, uh, rescheduling that uh, treatment for the poorest countries. I was there at, in particular at the time of the uh, initiative for the most indebted countries in the world, the EPIC initiative. So in this context, I worked a lot with all the uh, IFIs. Um, then I spent also some of my time in financial regulation, um, dealing with you know banking regulation, uh, support to SMEs, uh, and so forth, and um, a lot of time also on European issues. And then I worked a lot. Part of my career was spent in a European institution where I worked for the Commission in DG Ecfin, and then uh, in the cabinet of the President of the European Council, uh, Herman van Rompuy. So I have a lot of experience of uh, European negotiation how to try to bring people together, find consensus uh, in, uh, and, and to find solutions uh, to uh, European um, issues and challenges. I was in particular in the cabinet of the President Van Rompuy in the, uh, at the core of the euro, euro area crisis uh, between 2010 and 2012, at a time where we really need been fighting to find some solution for uh, to, to enhance the euro area and to keep it together. Uh, and then I moved back to France in the, cab the um, cabinet of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister office uh, in Paris for uh, more than 10, 12 months. And then I managed, I was the number two of Caisse des Dépôts, uh, so Deputy Director General of a very big financial institution in France, which is uh, providing financing to uh, local authorities, public housing, um, in a lot of investment also in the local areas in relation with the local authorities, and with the management of a very large uh, balance sheet of more than uh, uh, 300 billion euros. So in this uh, capacity, uh, I had a lot of I mean, uh, I learned a lot about uh, how to manage a financial institution, um, how to um, uh, monitor risk, how to manage a network, you know, in relation with the local authorities to, uh, for us to find projects, ensure that these are the right projects, uh, screening, I mean, uh, screening the investment uh, uh, and, and so forth. And it was very, um, very interesting and uh, as I said, I learned a lot uh, in these very concrete uh, responsibilities of managing a financial institution. And then I was back in the finance ministry at the head of the treasury uh, since four years. And uh, in this capacity, um, I worked or I work on all the issues related to economic policies in France, be it uh, financial regulation, international um, uh, development, uh, once again, Paris Club, and I worked a lot on the DSSI initiative, uh, G20, G7, IMF, and so forth, but also trade issues and um, European issues. Uh, uh, I'm the member of the EFC, and um, economic policies, because in a way we are providing some uh, advice for the government on um, economic and structural policies. 
So this is quite large. And uh, I think this gives me, this experience gives me um, two key uh, assets for uh, the EBRD presidency. The first one is, I would say three key assets. The, the first one is um, strong um, expertise in development uh, and uh, financial issues and economic policy uh, conduct uh, in different contexts. The second one is um, strong experience in multilateral and um, uh, international relation, negotiation, consensus building, and so forth. And the last one is um, management of a large organization, because in the uh, Treasury I'm managing now more than uh, 1,400 uh, people. So management of a large organization, um, which is, I think, is uh, also an important asset for the uh, BRD president. Great. Um, I'd like to give you the opportunity for a final word. Is there anything you would like to add that we perhaps haven't covered? No, I think that the very shortly, I think that the EBRD is at, is at an important time of its history, um, having managed very successfully uh, its first uh, part of its mandate and its uh, uh, bringing the countries of uh, its historical country of operation, bringing it by them very closely, I mean, up to in the transition, um, transition pass. Uh, it has now to um, reach the same success with the countries which, on which it, interven it intervenes since, more, uh, since um, more recently. So same eight countries and uh, I think there is uh, uh, very important challenges to be as successful and, uh, and uh, provide the same support uh, with the same success in these countries. And I think that now the possible, uh, possible uh, uh, extension to uh, some new countries in sub-Saharan countries may be a new challenge for the BRD. I'm very much um, committed, uh, if I'm elected, to work with all shareholders to address, to be successful in these challenges and to uh, ensure that the bank uh, provides uh, value for, for money for its shareholders and all its shareholders and also um, is uh, focused to um, ensure that its financing are, uh, have a positive impact uh, for the development, are very effective in supporting the development of the countries. I think I'm a con person which is uh, very open to dialogue, very open to collective action, and um, very committed to my task, my job. And I think that's uh, what the EBRD needs. And I would be, if I'm elected, I would be very um, committed to ensure that uh, we are successful in reaching these uh, objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madame Renaud Basso. Again, thank you very much for agreeing to set out uh, your vision for the EBRD. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>